General, give us your assessment first, please, on, on how the war is actually going on the ground. Well, the war is not going well for Ukraine. Uh, but in the big scheme of things, it's also not going so well for uh, Russia. I think what we have seen across the past eight or nine days is a Russia that thought this was going to be a quick and easy campaign, and it was not. And therefore, I think the assumptions they made and the planning that they made was inadequate to task. And so we've seen a Russian army that's had a lot of problems accomplishing those things that it needs to accomplish. I also want to right now just say we've seen a Ukrainian army that I don't think the world expected how well they had prepared and how determined they are. And that as well is giving Russia a lot of problems. But before we finish the question, the bottom line is uh, Russia is making now slow but steady progress. They're having a lot of trouble in the North. They're doing better in the Northeast and their best success has been in the South. Why do you think they are making uh, such slow progress in, in the North? I mean, they are performing poorly by their own timelines. There's a suggestion that fighting the Rasputitsa season, the mud season, which is what we're now into in, in Ukraine, the ground incredibly wet, that is slowing them down. Do you buy that? Well, there's a whole bunch of things, I think, there. Uh, one, um, the ground is not as frozen as they want it to be. You, I know, as well as I, have seen all of the pictures of the tanks that are trying to get off the road and go around clogs in that, in that big, big uh, line of vehicles to the north of Kiev. And when they get off of the roads, they get mired uh, over their tracks in mud, and, and many of them are left behind. So, uh, one, the weather is not supporting them. Two, again, I think they overplanned or made assumptions too big on how fast they can move and get through there. And I can't confirm, but I hear reports uh, in the last 24 hours that, that maybe this group in the north are a lot of uh, forces that were brought together from disparate parts of Russia who've never worked together and maybe their coordination and command and control is not as solid as one would expect. And we're getting into what I think has to be described as a, a war of attrition now. The war of Blitzkrieg is over. The war of long sieges potentially uh, in those city centers are now creeping in. How many fatalities do you think we're looking at if these sort of long sieges play out and effectively the Russians really try and either bombard or starve the Ukrainians out. Yeah, let me uh, sort of applaud you in trying to describe what's about to happen. I wouldn't use any of those words. A no, war no. of attrition is more of a force on a force. And what we're seeing is not that. What we're seeing is is cities being besieged and and bombarded. And, and, uh, and essentially what we're seeing now is Russia has uh, not been able to do this by finesse, and now they're going to be doing it by mass and atrocity. If you look what's going on in the Northeast near Kharkiv, if you look in what's going on in the Southeast around the town of Mariupol, I mean, these are, these are horrible, horrible approaches to warfare. We've seen it before in Grozny and Chechnya. We've seen Russia do this before in the eastern deserts of Syria, in this sort of depopulation and, and rubbleizing effort on these towns is going to play itself out in a really ugly way. The other part of your question is really the interesting one. Really, it's the interesting one. How many casualties are we going to see? Well, I think that's a question that we should be asking Western leaders. How many casualties does it take before we take a different approach to this war? You know, I think uh, there's 42 million or so Ukrainians. Does it take 42 million to convince uh, the West that, that we should have a different approach to this war? This is <clears throat> questions that need to be going to leaders now. Uh, make no mistake, while everybody's trying to help and send stuff, and, and I applaud that, and I'm happy for that, and I'm actually trying to help facilitate some of that. But the bottom line is Ukraine is fighting alone, and they're fighting for Western values and Western morals right now.
Just spell out what you mean by what a different approach would actually look like. Well, you know the answer to that, but you want me to say it and I'll do that. So you know that I have actually one of a group of people, and I would tell you it's a growing group of people now that are calling for some sort of a no-fly zone. I originally called for what you would call, for what you would describe as a traditional military no-fly zone. And uh, that was roundly rejected by the leaders of the West. And frankly, I understand their reasoning. I explained it in my first article that there are risks and this is a decidedly military act and it could be considered an act of war. So I get it. But I don't think that we should stop looking at ways that we can help the Ukrainians. Uh, My colleague and I, Ambassador Kurt Volker, have proposed now a humanitarian no-fly zone, which is a very different approach to helping uh, the the, uh, Ukrainian people. If you remember uh, just uh, almost 24 hours ago, there was an agreement to have a pause and a humanitarian uh, exodus from Mariupol. As soon as the people got out and exposed it on the roads, the Russians attacked them. Remember that this also happened in 2014. And so if we're going to encourage no-fly, uh, if we're going to inclu- encourage humanitarian corridors and the movement of people in and out of these besieged cities where Russia is rubbleizing and dehumanizing the cities, then we need to protect their exodus. 2014, history. Today, more history. Of- General, the, 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 the thing is... Attack. General, the one thing that both the West, NATO, European leaders, British leaders, American leaders, and the Russians seem to agree on is that imposing a no-fly zone uh, above Ukraine for humanitarian reasons uh, or for reasons of force is an act of war. I think you just conceded that yourself. So if we impose one, we will be at war with Russia. I absolutely concede that the traditional military no-fly zone is an act of war. I have already said that. Are you you suggesting we go to war with Russia? No, now you're joining the crew who of people who really mischaracterize how this is taught. So uh, listen, the second part of this is what I'm now talking to anyone who will listen about. And, and the group is growing. And that is a no-fly zone for humanitarian purposes. One in which we go in with a decidedly non-bellico set of rules of engagement. And those rules of engagement whereby we talk to our enemy And we say, we are not going to fire on you unless you fire on us. And I think what is the purpose of of your humanitarian no-fly zone? Just to to explain. Keep the atrocities like just happened in the last 24 hours in Mariupol from happening again. I mean, if you if you have an agreement between the two belligerents that we're going to have a humanitarian uh, corridor or a pause. And then as soon as that humanitarian movement um, starts, the other belligerent fires on and takes advantage of those people who believed in the thought of a humanitarian corridor and exodus. Right. This is this is tantamount to war crime in my mind. And I'm just a military guy. Please don't don't count me as a lawyer. I'm just a military guy. But general but the fact of the matter is that Russia has the history of doing exactly that. General, we need for the Russians to, sorry to interrupt, but for the Russians to, for us to pull off a humanitarian air corridor, we would need the Russians to be complicit in that. What if they don't? We would need their cooperation. And if they say no? Well, then we don't have a no-fly zone, do we? I mean, if it's a humanitarian no-fly zone. Mm. Okay, so it's a no-fly zone which the Russians have to uh, agree to. You wouldn't try and impose any type of no-fly zone without the Russians agreeing. No, uh, you've misconstrued again. You remember, I originally proposed a military no-fly zone. One is one that is imposed on the Russians. Um, But as we both understand, uh, leaders in the West have said no to that construct. So now we're trying to lead thought. Why would we stop and just throw our hands up and say, Mr. Putin wins. He's intimidated us again. We have taken counsel of our fears and we're going to do nothing. Um, I think we need to have new thought and we're putting new ideas on the table. One new idea is this humanitarian no-fly zone, Mm. which would require some acceptance by Russia 
to allow humanitarian. We would actually hope that even in Mr. Putin's heart, he could find a way to agree to some humanitarian relief. Let me ask you, apart from the no-fly zone, we're trying to arm the Ukrainians as well. That's the other thing that NATO, the British, the Americans are doing. Now, in the last 24 hours or so, one of President Zelensky's aides has said, you keep on telling us this is arriving, but we need these anti-tank, these anti-aircraft weapons right now. They're simply not getting to our troops when they need them. Uh, are we even able to, to arm the Ukrainian resistance as quickly as they need to be armed to hold back the Russians? Well, you know, the truth will sort of sort itself out over time. The United States is now saying that its last tranche of almost 350 million dollars has arrived and is rapidly moving forward. Clearly, uh, you see from the president and other people in Ukraine that they don't see it that way. I, I think you have to remember the what the old uh, wise men about war say about fog and friction. Uh, the truth is going to lie somewhere in the middle. Um, clearly, some of the weapons are getting through because they're having some battlefield effect. But are they getting there fast enough? That will be sorted out in the dust. One side is saying no, the other side is saying yes. But what will get worse and worse is the ability of us to get those things to the border and then Ukraine to move them inland. Mm. And if you believe what you're seeing now in Kharkiv, in Mariupol, and on the outskirts of Kiev, we're going to see a lot of casualties and a lot of requirements for medical supplies going in and bringing out the horribly wounded uh, to be able to seek medical attention. So we're going to need to think about that. And oh, by the way, I, I just want to put out there, I'm not going to attribute because I'm going to let them roll this out, but a, a group of very learned colleagues, a couple of uh, mentors of mine and, and, and really uh, uh, thinking people are now talking about trying to institute a humanitarian airlift mm. into uh, Ukraine. And so what you see now is thinking people beginning to think for new ideas rather than just sanctions, more sanctions, additional sanctions, deeper sanctions, special sanctions, extra special sanctions. We need to break out of that and begin to think about other things we might uh, tactically do to help the Ukrainian military. There is, of course, the other argument, which is that we just simply have to draw a line of which we count further cross. Now, that could well mean that Putin could win this war. He's not going to win a war of occupation, but he could destroy Ukraine while he's going about it. How worried would you then be if he does that, if, he, if he's seen to succeed, certainly temporarily, he could then expand the war, expand over those NATO borders, uh, uh, for example, the Sawalki Gap uh, near Kaliningrad. That is supposed to be uh, another great target of his. So let me, get, let me get to that in just a second. I mean, <clears throat> but your question goes back to the very first question I ask you. How many Ukrainians have to die? OK, and if we allow... Ukraine to fall to Russia, I do believe that 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 this this army that's in Ukraine now is going to have a real hard time uh, controlling a nation of well it used to be 42 million it's down to 41 now because a million have left and and more will leave but still subjugating uh, a nation that large is going to be mm -hmm. an incredibly expensive ta task mm -hmm. and an, a very a very hard task. Now you asked a question which I think is is on people's mind, but I don't ask that question. I do believe that Mr. Putin understands what a NATO territory are. I mean, our leaders can't wait to say, we're not gonna fight in Ukraine, but we're gonna defend every inch of NATO. So I think Mr. Putin gets the idea, and you asked me about NATO nations. I'm far more concerned about the other non-NATO nations out there, the Moldovas, the Georgias, mm. that, that Mr. Putin will still consolidate. And I'll ask you another question. Do you think that Belarus is ever gonna be the same again? Uh, Mr. Putin is now in Belarus and he'll be there to stay. Mm. Whether Mr. Lukashenko becomes his puppet or somebody else becomes his puppet, um, um, Belarus will never be the same. And so 
I see or worry about those nations first, because I do believe Mr. Putin understands NATO boundaries. Let me ask you about something else, which is uh, something which some people uh, have suggested, a lot of people would like to see this happen, and that's President Putin being taken out, being assassinated, uh, cutting the head off this whole mad operation. How easy is it for the West to do that, and is that a credible scenario? I'm not even going to talk to that. You know, I, I think that that's, that's talk that I, I wouldn't sit down and, and counsel. Why not? I do believe, I do believe that um, while sanctions have never changed Mr. Putin's actions, sanctions after 08, sanctions after 14, the warning of sanctions going into this battle in 2022, sanctions have never changed Mr. Putin's actions. Certainly they've hurt Russia and the Russian people and the Russian economy, and there lies the conversation you might should have. And that is, will conditions get so bad that his own people rise up and depose him? Um, you already have seen generals speaking out against this war, and you've seen oligarchs beginning to speak out against this war as they watch their fortunes go like that. So, so uh, while I still don't believe these sanctions will ever change Mr. Putin's actions, what it might cause is other in Russia to rise up against Mr. Putin. And I but think- How that, long? How long will that take? Because that's the great question, isn't it? No, the great question is how many Ukrainians are gonna die before that happens. I wanna keep bringing you back to that. Ukrainians are dying right now. They're standing on the battlefield alone. Okay, that's a very, very stark message. Um, I take it you're not in for some sort of assassination attempt because you don't think that that might be illegal. You don't think that would work. The only thing, the only solution I think you're proposing is, is to concentrate on Ukraine now and for the West to be more proactive. Well, we in the West have been on a path of what I call passive deterrence. And it couldn't be better defined than if, how many times did you hear our leaders going into this? Uh, uh, we're telling Mr. Putin what we're going to do. And if he does this, then we're going to do that. If he does this, then we're going to do that. That is the definition of passive. We should have put sanctions on him and showed him what his path was forward. And maybe a more active form of that would have deterred Mr. Putin. But that's behind us now. Mm. And now what we need to do is what are the active measures that we're going to take? And let me once again acknowledge what is happening that is so good. And that is nations are coming and, and bringing a kit and they're bringing supplies and they're showing support. And, and, but it stops at the border of Poland and Ukraine, and then Ukraine has to take the fight from there. So, so let's not, let's not uh, denigrate the good work that's being done but the question is, is it enough? Are we gonna take the actions this time that means we won't be back here in two or three more years? In 14, we didn't clean, get it cleaned up. That was part of the reason we were back, or excuse me, in 08, we didn't handle it well. That's why we were back in 14, at least one of the reasons. And we didn't handle it completely well in 14, and that's why we're back now. And we didn't deter him before this conflict because he looked at what the West was promising and he said, I can handle that. And boom, in he went. And now we have to make decisions about are we going to take the actions that will preclude this weapon from being used against us again in the future? General, final question. You were, of course, Supreme Allied Commander back in 2014, the last time Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Did you say this at the time? Could you wish you now you would have done more, have said more at the time, and use your position to have done something about it? Well, remember that in the West, including your country, we have a great tradition of civilian control of the military. When uh, military officers are asked to provide options, we provide options and then our civilian uh, masters appropriately make decisions. And often what, we, uh, often what we provide as far as options are either adopted 
more often they're not adopted or modified or lessened or whatever. I'm not going to go back and I don't think it's appropriate now that I dissect the processes of 14. But uh, we, we gave our best military advice to the leaders at the time, and they made their decisions. Probably the best thing that came out of 14 is NATO, for the first time in its history, made probably the largest changes to readiness in its history. And so we started moving towards the adopting the very high readiness task force. We started putting forward forces from NATO in the Baltic nations, Poland, Romania, et cetera. So we made some great military changes afterwards, but uh, you were asking about the question going in and we'll just leave it that way. Military people make recommendations and the chain of command is, is to the civilian leadership and they then make decisions. I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, General Philip Breedlove, thank you so much for your, your, your certainly very passionate and forthright thoughts this morning. Thanks for talking to TNG. Thank you. 